One of the things that I love about uh, Thanksgiving is, uh, first of all, it, it doesn't, doesn't have to stop. There's a great tradition of Thanksgiving that I observe, breakfast pie. How many of you have discovered the joy? Liz and I have, have that. that I, I love that. If you've never tried a breakfast pie, pie and coffee is the most amazing combination there is. So there's that. How many of you are with me on that? The other thing I like about Thanksgiving, we kind of hinted at it, is uh, that it just goes so seamlessly and swiftly right into the Advent season. So yesterday, Janice was taking down fall decorations, but there was no time to get sad because she turned right around and opened up the Christmas boxes, and, uh, and, and, it, was, uh, and it was great. I don't know what will happen come January. All bets are off for that one. But, uh, so I, I love this, uh, this quick segue into, into Advent. Elvis crooned once, why can't every day be like Christmas? Well, for a follower of Jesus Christ, in some respects, it, it is. Jesus hasn't gone anywhere. He's right here, inside my heart, inside your heart. And, and so every Sunday for us, in some fashion, is a celebration of Christmas, of Easter, and these great things. But as we do every year, we like to, to focus on a new theme uh, for the Advent season. And this theme we're talking about today just fits hand in glove with Christmas, this theme of generosity, just like pie and coffee, just fits together, just like that. And, uh, and, and I think we're going to enjoy this series together. How many of you want to be thought of by others as a generous person? Most of us, right? I mean, what would be the opposite of that? You, you want to be thought of as a skin flint, a, a miser, a, you know? You, you look at the pictures on your, on your note sheet, you can pick George Bailey or you can pick uh, Mr. Potter. Which do you want to be? When you think of someone who's generous, how do you picture their face, their visage? Don't you picture them cheerful and smiling? And, and how do you picture someone who's not generous? Look at Mr. Potter. So what would you rather be, Scrooge or Bob Cratchit? The Grinch or Cindy Boo-Hoo? Boo hoo Lou hoo I got, I, I got to get caught up on that. So if that's the desire of your heart to be considered a more generous person, the Bible's going to give us all kinds of tips this month on how we can accomplish that. And so I'm, I've really been looking forward to, to uh, launching into this, this new series. And I want everybody to relax as we begin it. We're not out after your money, okay? God is, but we're not. And in fact, God's not actually after your money because... He already owns it. What he's after is our hearts. Because it's so easy in this area of finances and money and giving, it's so easy for our hearts to get overrun by fear and worry and greed and jealousy and striving. And, and God wants us to be free of that. And uh, as we get into God's word this month, I believe that God is going to help us, especially now during a pandemic, to experience vibrant, joyful, contented lives. And that's where these teachings are meant to bring us. So uh, this morning, we simply want to ask uh, the question, why? Why should we, as followers of Christ, pursue generosity? And uh, to help us answer this question, we're going to dive straight in to the middle of a fundraising letter that Paul writes in, this, in his second letter to the Corinthians. If you've got your Bibles, uh, open them up to 2 Corinthians 9. And we're going to parachute right into the middle of this fundraising section. We're going to read verses 6 to 12 today. Now, the occasion for this section of the letter that Paul is writing to the Corinthians, uh, it just so happened as he was writing this that a very severe famine had spread over Judea. And the Christians in Jerusalem were suffering uh, because of this, this famine, while the, the Christians up in Asia were, were spared from that. And so what Paul is doing here to help the Christians down in Judea is he's raising an offering that will go to their aid and help bring them relief. And it's absolutely unprecedented what we're seeing here in the Bible. You know, today, when a, when a natural disaster of some kind occurs, an earthquake or a flood or, or something like this, it's, it, it, we, we often see it, nations rally together to offer help. And, and oftentimes, usually often, uh, the, the U.S. leads the way. But this wasn't always the case. You had an earthquake back then. 
or some s severe natural calamity, you're pretty much on your own. The Romans might send some engineers to help rebuild your roads, but that's, that's it. A, a good case can be made that Christianity gave this idea to the world that we see illustrated so often today of helping each other. I mean, it's a, think of it. These Asian Christians are going to send relief to the Christians down in Judea. Gentile believers are going to send help to Jewish believers. It's mind-blowing. The world did not know this kind of love until followers of Christ showed it. So we're going to jump right in the middle of this section where Paul is explaining the need for this offering and why the Corinthian believers should be eager to share in it. So let's read from verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, and here Paul quotes uh, Psalm 112, he has distributed freely. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So as I was studying this passage er earlier, I, I could discern f at least four reasons why followers of Christ should practice generosity. And here's the first one. Jot this down. It's very simple. We were created to be generous. We were created to be generous. We are created, us humans, in what? The image of God. And Paul uh, can't, can't say it enough here in this little section, how generous God is. He quotes Psalm 112, where when you read that psalm, it, it describes the generosity of a righteous person, how, how giving a, a person who believes in God should be. And why can a, a righteous person be generous? Well, you read the psalm and you'll find out, because God has been so generous with us. And, and you can't be loved by a generous God and not respond by yourself being generous. Giving is at the very heart of God's nature. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus taught generosity frequently. Luke 6, 38, Jesus said, Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. And Paul reminds the Corinthian believers here that, that our generous God stands poised, stands, stands ready, if we give, to just shower blessings upon us. So we don't need to be afraid of giving. God is able to make all grace abound to you, he says. God can multiply your seed. He can increase the harvest of your righteousness. With God, life is not a zero-sum game. You know, a zero-sum game, believing that life is like that, means if I give a dollar away, now what? I'm down a dollar. I'm down in the, in the ledger, but not in the kingdom of God. Since God owns the cattle of a thousand hills, he has boundless capacity to meet the needs of his children. So this little boy comes up to Jesus with five loaves and two fish, probably uh, the dinner that he was bringing home to his family that night. That's probably what they were going to eat. But he gives it to Jesus. Is he now back to zero? Hardly. Jesus is God in human flesh. A generous God in human flesh. And you know what happens with those five, five uh, loaves and two fish? Jesus feeds a multitude with them. I saw a story recently called uh, Genetically Wired for Gratitude. And it's about a group of scientists who are studying what makes humans kind or generous. And what they've discovered, at least in this article, is that Darwin was wrong. It's not survival of the fittest. It's survival of the kindest. It's survival of the generous. 
Gratitude, according to one researcher, is so closely related to happiness, this researcher said, it's practically the same thing. Here's science supporting what Christians have been talking about for 2,000 years, what the Bible does talk about from the very beginning. Genetically wired for gratitude. Well, who's the electrician who did the wiring? We're made in his image. And so you cannot worship this God and not strive to be generous. You, you cannot follow Jesus and not strive to be generous. Jesus gave the greatest gift imaginable. And he gave himself to bring us back to himself. And to give us life. So we're created to be generous. That's huge right there. Just drop the mic. We, right there. That's, that should be reason enough. But Paul goes on in this, uh, this section. There's a second reason. And actually it ties in with this first one. The point is this. Life is more fulfilling when I'm generous. Life is more fulfilling when I'm generous. And, and I want to unpack that study here. That we just uh, mentioned a, a moment ago. Paul tells the Corinthians, if they respond with generosity, he says, you'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Give and, it'll be gi and it will be given to you, Jesus said. And Jesus isn't being crassly materialistic here like those those infamous TV preachers that we all know about, you know, who get on TV and they say, send us your money. And, and they, they, they give you the impression that the moment you, you hit the send button, you might as well run out to your mailbox because checks are going to be just flying into your box. That's not what Jesus is talking about. The Bible's point here, give and, and you'll be blessed, is, is much deeper and broader than that. I found another article a couple of years ago might have shared this with you uh, a while back, but it's called 31 Benefits of Gratitude. And, and gratitude and generosity go hand in hand. They're kind of like kissing cousins. Yes? You know, what you can say about one, you can say about the other. So this article was a summation of all the scholarly work on gratitude that's been done in recent years, and they summarized it with a beautiful diagram. I want to I want to show this to you now, this this diagram. Colton, if we could put that on the... And you'll see the big headings, uh, emotional, see that? And social, career, health, personality, underneath that are things that will be harder to read. We'll make this available to you this week. But each one of these little quadrants, uh, they make reference to countless studies that have been done that show that, hey, if, if you're a generous person, if you're a thankful person, it's going to have payoff in your emotional life. You're going to be more resilient, more relaxed, less envious. You're going to be more content. It's going to have impact on your social life. You're going to have a healthier marriage if you practice generosity and gratitude. You're going to have more friendship and deeper relationships. And, and uh, you know, pick a card, any card. It's going to help your career. It's going to help you physically if you practice these, these things. And, and your personality as, as well. There's not an area in your life that is not impacted by practicing generosity and gratitude and these virtues. And like I said, we'll make this available uh, this week. We'll put it in the Bible study. You'll have the Bible study available tomorrow. Uh, and we'll stick that in there so you can look at it yourself. Now, if something is created to run a certain way and you use it in the way it was designed, it should run optimally, should it not? Yes, my car was designed to run on unleaded gas. I put unleaded gas in. I expect good performance from my vehicle. Now, what happens if I put ketchup in the gas tank or Pepsi? What can I expect in that case? <laughs> well, they try all kinds of things in Iowa, you know, where I, I'm from. So uh, ethanol, isn't that kind of a ketchup derivative? I, I'm not sure. But we humans, and, and what's going to happen with the car? It's going to show that we're, we're not using it as, as, it was, as it was designed. A human being is not all that different from a car in this respect. We were created by God to live in certain ways. And when we depart from that design, so we're created to live with generosity and gratitude in our hearts. When I don't live that way, 
something inside of me is going to gag and wheeze and choke and shut down. However, if I do live in accordance with how God set it up, life is going to be more fulfilling. Proverbs 11.25, if you're taking notes, jot this down. It's a great verse. Proverbs 11.25, a generous person will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. I love that. Now, in case you are wondering about the financial piece, it is true, and the studies bear this out, that... Yes, if you practice generosity, you will also reap a financial reward with that. The TV preachers aren't entirely incorrect, but that's, that's how false teaching goes, isn't it? They give you just a little bit of, uh, of truth. However, the reason that happens is not what the TV preachers say, and it certainly doesn't happen overnight. And we'll talk about this later on in the series. The getting back which uh, we receive when we give, this reaping what we sow, Touches every area of life. We could take that slide down, Colton. You can take that, take that down now. It's survival of the kindness. Kind and generous people come out ahead at every level. You see, and you say, okay, well, if this is true and if science supports it with, with study after study and the Bible's been teaching it for a thousand years, then, then why do we see so little of it? And why is it so hard to practice? Well, that's because this is like exhibit 1,309 that proves we have a sin nature. The things that we were created to live for no longer appeal to us. We used to be ma magnetically drawn to God. Now we're not. It's a battle now you and I must face. Yet one more reason why we need Christ to be in our lives. So, there's a spiritual reason for being generous. I'm created by God to be this way. There's a physiological and emotional reason that I should be generous. It will be far more fulfilling in the end. There's also a practical reason for generosity. Let's move on to the third reason. Through generosity, God's love and goodness grows and overflows. God's love and goodness grows and overflows. I give, and as a result, somebody else is uplifted is helped, finds encouragement, is given life, where once they had fear and worry and anxiety, all that has been replaced by joy and light when, when I give. Paul says this in verse 12, for the ministry of this service, this giving, is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also is an overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. Generosity is the most, one of the most amazing things powers that God has given to us. And there's so many stories that we could share of its power. We could do another 30-second story blitz and have you share stories of ways in which you've experienced the power of generosity in your life. When uh, we lived in Connecticut uh, a few years back, I remember a news story that celebrated the generosity of a 25-year-old uh, Hartford man named Raju Gomez, who every year since he turned 16, so when I first saw the story, he'd been doing this for eight or nine years, hosted a Christmas Day dinner for the homeless in, in their area. The first time he did it, uh, eight or nine years earlier, he had taken $900, he was 16 years old, took $900 of his own money to, to pay for this. His father owned a restaurant, and so he got his father to, to open up his restaurant on Christmas Day. And then he chartered some buses, and he brought in 45 homeless people and fed them Christmas dinner that day. And every year, he did this, up until I saw the story nine years later, when he was 25, when he was preparing to bring in 600 Homeless people in the Hartford area to serve them Christian, uh, Christmas dinner. Where did Raju get the inspiration for this great generosity? In the story, he says where it came from. It came from a neighbor. It came from a woman who befriended their family shortly after they arrived from the country of Bangladesh. And this woman became their friend. She arranged doctor's appointments from them. She helped them all learn English. She tutored Raju and his four siblings. And she performed, Raju said, quote, a thousand other kindnesses. Well, look at what one generous person unleashed on that part of the world. 
when we learn to pay it forward, this is the miracle that can happen. This is the power of generosity. And it overflows, Paul says. One woman befriends one family. And where does it end up? Overflowing, spreading, until hundreds of lives are caught up in the party of God's love in Christ. That's how God drew it up on the chalkboard when he created us. This also is what Jesus meant when he told his disciples, you know, boys, you're going to do greater works than even I do. Can you imagine the disciples being one of them and hearing Jesus say that? And you're like, what are you smoking, Jesus? Uh, you heal and uh, look at everything that you, you, you do. But Jesus wasn't talking about the, the quality of the work. He's talking about quantity. Jesus, though God, was one body. Now if he could multiply himself through 12 disciples, suddenly goodness starts to multiply. And then what if those 12 disciples go out and win 3,000 others? And bring them into the kingdom, which happened on the first day in which the church was born. And what if those 3,000 go out and win thousands more? It becomes a movement of generosity that overflows until the love of Christ is being experienced everywhere. You're going to do greater works than I will do, Jesus said to them, and he's saying to us. Can you imagine if 100 people that are attached to Bridgeway, would say to themselves and say to God this, this Christmas season, Lord, would you cause your goodness and love to overflow through me this Advent season? I want to be a useful instrument in your hands. I want to do something along the lines of what Raju did in Hartford. I, give me an opportunity. Can you imagine what would happen? I want you to hold that thought, and I'll come back to it in just a few minutes. So why be generous? We were created to be generous. Hmm? We uh, discovered that uh, life is more fulfilling when we're generous. All those ways in which it blesses us. Jesus said it's better to give than to receive. And here's, here's one of the reasons for that. Thirdly, through generosity, God's love and goodness overflows. And a fourth reason, we'll wrap up with this. God commands that my plenty be used for another's want. God commands that my plenty be used for another's want. In case you haven't noticed, God's ordinary way of helping us when we're in need is how? It's through other people, is it not? Seldom is, is the provision manna straight from heaven. God does this a few times, and in a pinch, Elijah is dying in the wilderness, and God dispatches ravens to come and feed him. God will do that in a crisis, but normally when God sees that you will have a need, he will dispatch somebody to help meet that need for you. That will be his hands and feet to you. Jesus meant it when his followers, when he, when he called his followers, his body. And that's, that's what the Asian Christians were going to be to the Jewish Christians, the, the Christians in Judea. We're one body. Let's help each other out here. There's a, there's a story about this as well that it illustrates the idea that if you insist on God himself and only God being the one to help you and nobody else, if you insist on that, those being the rules, there's a story that reminds uh, of us of the folly of that. You, you probably know the story and have used it. There was a guy who, uh, during a flood, climbed up on his roof. And he said, God help me! Those of you that know the story, somebody comes along in a boat, yeah, and, and says, hey, there's room in the boat. No, 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 God's going to help me. Helicopter come, Coast Guard comes flying in, sends down a ladder. Get on, the, get on the ladder. No, God's, God helps me. What happens to him? He dies. <laughs> he drowns. And he gets before God and he drives himself off and he's in heaven. Why didn't you save me? And God says to him, I did. <laughs> I sent you a boat and a helicopter. This is the way that God usually works for us. And and, and God's wisdom here is so simple and so elegant and so beautiful how God works it out. God gives an overabundance to each one of us at certain times in our lives. And he asks us then to use some of that plenty 
to help others that are in need. Right now, the, 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 the believers in Corinth, these Gentile Christians, they're not suffering the effects of the famine. They're not having a supply shortage. Everything's okay for them. But they're having an abundance. So Paul says to them, and he says this in chapter 8 and verse 14, at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The day's going to come, Paul says to them, when your abundance probably is going to dry up. And what are you going to do then? Well, then they're going to take care of you at that point. And I believe that this is how God designed life to be. That we need each other. And even at a national level, I believe that this is, is, is so. We can't do life alone. And so when God gives us an abundance of blessings, it's not meant for us alone. He wants to use some of it for others. And when John the Baptist came along and he began calling, to pe calling people to repent, people would... People cried out and they said, what do you want us to do? How do we show our repentance? Do you remember some of what John said? He said, let, let him who has two coats give to him who has none. That's how, how John said we're to express our repentance. But 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet do not think this way. And, and many of them are Christians. Most people on the earth today just automatically assume that any bounty they receive in life, any increase they receive in pay, a raise they get, a promotion they get, any blessing that, that, that has their name on it, it's all meant for them. That's how we think. It's our instinct. New York Times had a story of a guy um, who received $10 million after his father died, and he received it from his dad's estate. What would you do with 10 big ones? Would that be good? Do you know this guy lost it all a little over 10 years later? That's when the New York Times caught up with him. You say, how do you lose $10 million? He was dead broke. He was driving an 11-year-old beaten-down SUV. He was living on a, in a $900 a month, sparse, sparsely furnished uh, one-bedroom apartment. He was trying to stay afloat teaching at a community college. And the article spells out what he did. He, he bought a mansion in the Adirondacks, a vacation home in England, another in Vermont. More cars than they could drive, including an Aston Martin. He must have had, was that James Bond's car? I, he must have been in a midlife crisis of some kind, you know. They bought horses. One was worth, I'm looking at my wife, the horse lover, $173,000. Would you be okay if I did that for you? You don't need that much? <laughs> you heard her. The... <laughs> The man, treated, uh, <laughs> the man treated his wife lavishly on her birthday weekends at the Waldorf Astoria, and he gave her routine gifts like a $7,000 mink coat. Ten years, tch, 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 living that way like a drunken sailor. And all that money, more than $10 million, was gone in a little over a decade. Not one mention in the article about giving any of that bounty away because he assumed, and this, he's obviously in an extreme case, but it's how most of us think, that any increase we see, it's just for us. God's love and goodness didn't increase one iota through this man and his family. And now it's all gone. And he'll have to answer for that. He'll have to give an accounting to God for the, what he did with his life. But before we all make fun of him, you know, we just have to look in the mirror and go, what would I do? Given, given an abundance, what's my reflex here? Our automatic response, I'm, I'm speaking to myself as well, automatic response. This again, the sin nature at work, my reflex, ah, I can increase my standard of living. My instinct is not, ah, I can increase my standard of giving. I can get to that point, but not easily. Rather than, rather than saying, uh, wow, what should I do with all my money? We should s start to develop the instinct to say, wow, what should I do with all of God's money? That's how we should start. And just to provide the balance, we're not saying, and the Bible doesn't say at all, that it's wrong or sinful to increase your standard of living. That is not what we're saying at, at all. To buy the better car, the larger house, the bigger TV should the opportunity present itself. 
to shore up your retirement, to pay off a debt, to take a vacation. All these things are good gifts from a loving God. So don't go to the other extreme and, and say that's what the Bible is, is, is saying. What the Bible is saying is do you have room in your heart? The Spirit of God comes and says, you know that, that extra money? I want you to start to, to bless others with some of that. How about making room in your heart for the larger human family around you? And God that will then increase his love and goodness through our generosity. Someone sent me a card with a picture of the Sea of Galilee on it a while ago, and it, and it read this. The Sea of Galilee teems with plant and animal life today, just as in Jesus' time, many an able fisherman earns a living from its bountiful waters. In startling contrast, the Dead Sea to the south is incapable of supporting life of any kind at all. In fact, so deadly are its waters, it's reported that birds won't even fly over them. The Sea of Galilee thrives because it not only receives water from the Jordan River, but it passes it on as well. The Dead Sea receives water from the Jordan River, but since there are no significant outlets for it, the water simply stays and stagnates. People are like those Ted C two C's, the card said. Those who receive and give in return are healthy, but those who receive and never give are doomed to stagnation. The card ends with these words, make me a giver, Lord. Say, say those words under your breath right now. Make me a giver, Lord. There are two objections that often come to mind when we think about the theme of generosity. Again, I'm preaching to myself. I use these same objections. The first thing I, is, is I'll, I'll think to myself, but I don't have enough, God. Hmm? God, I don't have enough, so I can't give because I lack resources. We're going to talk about this next week. And what we're going to discover is that there is a creative variety of ways in which we can give. You know, let him who has two coats give to him who has none. How many coats do you think you have? You think about that? And if you were to go through your household inventory and, and take note of those things that you have multiple items of, what do you think, uh, what do you think John the Baptist would say, say to us? Next week we're going to break that down and you realize that you have a lot more to be generous with than you even realize. The second thing we say is, it's not, not God, I, I don't have enough, but God, I, I won't have enough. I can't give. It, it's that, it's that zero-sum game again. God, if I give that away, then I'm down that amount. And, and God wants to awaken our faith and, and get rid of some of that fear to loosen our grip on our things. And we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. It's amazing what a little trust and faith in God can do for a person's perspective when it comes to, to worldly wealth. Well, as we wrap up, we can't talk about generosity in just an ethereal, theoretical fashion and not act on what we're learning. And so I'm going to extend an invitation to us as a church during this Advent season. And so we're going to invite you to share in an Advent project. We're going to call December generosity month here at, at Bridgeway and my invitation to you my challenge to each one of us and you at home as well we want you to share in this is for for you and your family to prayerfully and thoughtfully come up with at least one way perhaps a multitude of ways for you to practice generosity this month we're having our toys for tots give uh, giveaway uh, that will be gathering uh, up for uh, up till next week I believe one more Sunday so, so that can be part of it, but let's not stop there. And, and, and don't stop either with giving a $5 bill to the Amazon delivery man when he, when he comes. I don't want you to make any decisions this week. I just want you to be in thought mode. I want you to be in prayer mode and be talking to your family uh, as, uh, as you're praying at the dinner time, as you're having Advent devotions. Liz, do we have the... Uh, this year we're going to make available a resource that we've uh, had out... Uh, each of the last two advents it's a it's a little packet and it's um, a collection of devotionals that you can do with your family uh, each day of advent there's one for each day beginning today running all the way through christmas and so please pick up one of those as you leave it's it's the same one we used last year but you could do this every year and experience uh, 
a whole, have a whole new experience with it. So this week, I just want you to be thinking about what, and praying about God, what do you want us to do? I want you to get the juices flowing on, uh, on this and have fun with it and let God begin to, to open up your eyes and hearts to the possibility of practicing generosity this, uh, this Advent season.